Hi, everybody. I'm back. Um, and we are now just talking about communication and collaboration in healthcare. So let's talk about some of the elements of communication. You have a sender who has a message, and that message <clears throat> can be conveyed either verbally or non-verbally through a channel. And that channel might be words. It might be actions. It might be gestures. It might be text messaging or writing or some other method of communication. <clears throat> the message goes to the receiver who has to decode it, and then the receiver gives feedback so that the sender knows if that message was received accurately or not. Um, setting matters. Communication will be influenced by the setting and you know anything that's distracting from that message. Um, phones are going off or there's background noise or you know something else is happening. And the context of that communication um, matters. Is it an emergency situation where you need to use fewer words and um, speak and be very clear and concise? Or is it a longer conversation where you want to elicit as much information as possible? So those are just elements of communication. And we always want to come use communication to provide patient-centered care. And you won't know your patient preferences unless you ask them. Um, and you have to communicate through your nonverbal um, communication your body language, your tone of voice, your inflection, eye contact, um, that you are engaged in a caring process. And that <clears throat> patient-centered model um, is associated with much better outcomes. Um, communicating with a patient who has limited English proficiency, um, you probably have already experienced this in clinical. It's important to determine what language they actually speak best um, because you can make assumptions based on your bias. If you see somebody and they come from Guatemala, you might assume that they speak Spanish, when in fact, they have limited Spanish proficiency because they speak one of the 28 indigenous languages, like Quiche. Um, so it's important to confirm. Somebody might actually prefer English because they've been studying it for years and they, you know, they feel comfortable speaking with you in English. It's more spontaneous. Um, try not to use family members. Family members are not medical interpreters. Um, and you can't always verify what they're actually telling the patient. And they may not have a good understanding of what you're saying themselves to be able to communicate that. Um, their proficiency in the language, if they're you know, a child or grandchild, may be a lot less than you think. Um, try not to use like housekeeping and you know, other staff just because they're from that country, because those people don't have the medical background to be able to communicate effectively. Um, some patients will use Google Translate or other apps for non-medical information that's probably fine and faster. Um, but the best solution, especially when you're trying to um, educate a patient or get a history, um, something or explain their condition or their medications, you really should get a medically trained interpreter, um, a certified interpreter. And sometimes hospital have personnel um, fluent in a number of languages, and sometimes they have a system like Siricom. Um, Nonverbal communication can also vary by culture, so you need to be respectful and really look for cues of whether that person is comfortable with the way you're communicating. And there are a lot of things that can cause communication to break down. Let's talk about a few of them. Personal biases. If you assume you know something, you're not going to ask the questions you need to ask to get the information, right? Or um, if you think the doctors or the, you know, the other providers, um, you have biases about them, um, examine that because the communication is the key. You have to be professional. Um, avoid using value statements, anything that communicates to the patient that there is a right and wrong answer. You need to be neutral and respectful. Don't give false reassurance. Um, that will erode trust very quickly and use plain language. I mean, in healthcare, we have lots of little slangs and jargons and a lot of big words. Um, you wanna make sure that your communication is clear. And then evaluate that you were understood, whether you're using a closed loop communication method, or if you're doing patient discharge teaching, have them teach it back to you so that you are certain that the message was received in the way you intended to send it. Okay, collaboration in healthcare. I'm not going to read through these slides. You can access them through Google Slides. I will send you a link. 
What I am going to do is play this really short video, but first I'm going to like hide my little camera box. And I'm going to enlarge that. Okay, so I'm going to break that up because part of the slide speaks to a good team, <clears throat> an efficient team that is centered around patients will utilize the skills and scope of every member and they will include the patient. So what he's talking about structured interdisciplinary bedside rounding or cyber, um, this is a really good tool, underutilized, but really should become the standard. Okay, <clears throat> so let me X out of that. Sorry, give me one minute. Okay, so again, I'm not going to read the slide because it says all the same things they just said, and they said it better. So oh, moving along. Again, not going to read the slide. You can read it for yourself, but I am going to pause it every here and there um, at the good moments and tell you, like point out the communication that you see. Okay. So they're setting you up with a scenario. We have somebody coming in for induction of labor. And so that's the advantage of doing a huddle or a brief. <clears throat> and that's exactly what they're doing. It's a safety huddle. Everybody's getting together on the same page. And people are reviewing the same information. And when there's a discrepancy, they point it out and in a polite and respectful way. And then, you know, nobody makes that error.
Okay, now she's going to perform handoff or shift report. Yeah, that was mostly good communication. What I am going to say is that it would have been better at the bedside because they could have confirmed with the patient this, this is who you are, this is what your plan is, we're watching your blood pressure, um, and it would help with that orientation phase for Donna. Okay. Okay, so that was her S bar to Dr. Fom. It wasn't in the S bar format because the recommendation came first, but she included all the essential elements. This is the situation and this is what I need. Um, and they both had the background and assessment because they were, they did that huddle. And there's your cuss words. I'm concerned about our patient. I'm uncomfortable watching the late decelerations. And I don't think it's safe to continue labor. Okay, and that was another safety huddle. And now we have the anesthesiologist involved because we're considering that the patient may deteriorate and need to go to the OR to have her baby. Um, and so this is where everybody again gets on the same page and they update the status and all the information that's important, vital signs, fetal monitoring, um, <clears throat> and what the plan is, um, that's all being discussed. Okay, so now we see, oh, hold on. So now you saw an example of um, what's called a timeout. 
where before they proceed with an invasive procedure, everybody stops and listens. They identify the patient, make sure they've got the right person, identify the procedure and the reason for that procedure, and they make sure that the patient um, confirms everything. They looked for an informed consent. Without any of those things, um, it might not be safe to proceed because you could be performing surgery on the wrong patient or on the right site or on the wrong site or the wrong procedure, um, or there might be concerns you haven't identified. So the timeout is a very important aspect and it's got to be well communicated. Okay, and that is the whole video, um, but you saw really, really good examples. Now, there is a video somewhere on YouTube. I found it, but I'm not going to play it for you because the length of this video will get too long. Um, but they do the opposite, and it all goes bad, and everybody's mad at each other, and it doesn't go well. Oh. Okay, moving on. Okay, we're on the question part, so you're almost done. Let me get rid of my little box here. Which option represents a phase of the therapeutic relationship? A, the terminal phase, the on, B, the ongoing phase, C, the working phase, or D, the debriefing phase? Correct option is C. The therapeutic relationship is defined by the orientation phase, working phase, and termination phase, not terminal. Question two. A nurse is explaining the importance of exercise to an adolescent client. Client rolls her eyes. Which element of communication does the client's nonverbal behavior represent? And your choices are message, channel, sender, receiver, and feedback. So let's think about it. Who was the sender? The nurse was the sender. The message was about the importance of exercise. Her channel was verbal communication. The client rolls her eyes is the response. It's the feedback. Yes, the sender was a nurse. We did all that. Question three, the nurse is admitting a client to the telemetry unit. The client has recently migrated to the United States from Haiti. What should the nurse do to ensure communication is effective? A, identify the language the client prefers and obtain the service services of a trained medical interpreter. B, speak in English just louder and slower. C, ask the patient's family member to interpret. Or D, ask the housekeeper for the unit to interpret, since she's also from Haiti, you should know that the correct response is A. And again, she might come from Haiti. She might have migrated from Haiti recently, but maybe she grew up in the Dominican Republic and actually prefers Spanish. Okay, question four, which option is an example of implicit bias in healthcare? A, a nurse prefers working with a friend, Suzanne, and requests to be scheduled with her. B, a midwife states that obese women have higher risk for pregnancy complications based on a new study. C, a provider orders less pain meds for an African-American client, but insists that she treats all patients the same. And D, a nurse states that she thinks that all Eagle fans are insane. Correct response is C, a bias is a preference, prejudice, or stereotype based on attitudes, cultural, personal upbringing, or personal experiences. It may be favorable or unfavorable and may also be explicit or implicit. Option A is favorable, explicit bias toward working with a friend. Option B is not based on bias, it's based on evidence. Option C, in which a provider is unaware of a stereotyped attitude toward a client, but professes to treat all the patients the same, that is implicit bias. And D, if I say that all Eagles fans are nuts, that's explicit bias. I'm aware of it. I'm making a choice to express that attitude out loud. Okay, last one. Question five, which option is an example of effective interdisciplinary communication and collaboration? A, giving shift report at the desk. B, asking the charge nurse to call a provider. C, correcting a physical therapist who dis disconnects an IV to help the patient ambulate. Or D, interdisciplinary bedside rounding that includes all members of the care team, including the patient and family. Well, now, C is not entirely wrong unless well, you don't know how the nurse corrected the physical therapist. 
Was it in front of the patient? Was it done uncivilly? You are going to look at that padlet for incivility. So that doesn't really give you enough information. But D, interdisciplinary bedside rounding that includes all members of the care team, including the patient and family, gets everyone a chance to utilize their skills. All right. There we go. And we are done for this week, except you still need to do the padlet. All right, guys. Have a good week.